Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. My name is Melissa Marino. I'm the director of the Scheinfeld Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation here at Santa Barbara City College. Thank you. Um, um, I have a few announcements before we get started. Um, we are sponsored by the Small Business Development Center today, and that is a community, state, and federally funded um, organization that provides no-cost business coaching and counseling to the community, to the business community, and to startups. So uh, it's very important that you know the Small Business Development Center is a resource for everybody in this room and in the community uh, for uh, businesses needing help starting up, financing, funding, increasing sales, helping to create jobs, retain jobs, and helping to stress businesses. So if anybody is interested in those services, let me know after the event. And because we're sponsored by the SBDC tonight, we have evaluations. So at the end, I'll be passing out these evaluations, and I hope that each of you take a little time to evaluate this uh, event for us. Uh, you may or may not know that we happen to be in the middle of Global Entrepreneurship Week. So this particular event is part of a global movement to promote entrepreneurship. So you're part of that because you're here today. And I wanted to tell you just a little bit about what we do at the Scheinfeld Center. We have an academic program totally focused in entrepreneurship. Students can build their own businesses in the classroom. And we have eight courses specific to entrepreneurship, from introduction to entrepreneurship and innovation, all the way up until you get to business plan development. And along the way, you're building your business and developing your business plan. And uh, each course, you take away a portfolio piece of your business plan, whether it's a marketing plan, a feasibility study, and so on. So we really encourage you, if you haven't already, to explore our academic program in entrepreneurship. And around that academic program, we've built resources and events and experiences for students to complement that academic uh, study. And uh, this event is one of those. Our signature event, uh, You're Here, we offer it twice a year. It's the Enlightened Entrepreneurship Series designed to help uh, inspire you to keep pushing ahead and become an entrepreneur. And one other thing, activity that we've been doing that's very popular, this is our third semester that we've done it, and it's called Enterprise Launch. It's a student program, a student club setting, where we focus on the rapid development of a product or service in a single semester. And um, we just have uh, amazing participation and enthusiasm from the students. And um, after we uh, end this event, we will have a reception outside where you signed in, in the BC lobby. We're going to have some food, some drink, and our enterprise, some of our enterprise launch students will be showcasing some of their business products and taking um, surveys from you. So I hope you participate and um, explore with our students what they're doing in our enterprise launch program. Um, and we also have uh, an internship program, and there was information given to you about the types of internships that are available right now. It's one of the critical things that you can do for yourself in developing your career, whether it's for a company or as an entrepreneur. And so we really encourage you to participate in our internship program, and we're in the throes of placing students, and we have um, really great uh, sponsors out there, so we encourage you to inquire about that. And now, without further ado, does anybody know Professor Chavez? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Professor Chavez does a great job of moderating these events, and um, we've just uh, really, thanks to him, have had an amazing success with this series. And um, I think that you're in for a treat once again um, tonight. And uh, so I thank you for everything you do to help the Scheinfeld Center and support uh, this series. And so thank you so much. Thanks. Appreciate you're it. Welcome, Melissa. Thank you. Um, 
So, and now I'm going to introduce our speaker. Um, in, in, before I do that, I can fill these four seats right here. Um, if you're sitting along the edge, um, please feel free to take those four seats up front. And um, we do have some room along the edges here to sit, but I do need to save these other seats. So if you're uncomfortable or want to have a better view, you can come along the front. <clears throat> Our speaker tonight is recognized as one of the pioneers of internet marketing and e-commerce. Well known as the founder of ValueClick, one of the world's largest internet marketing companies. ValueClick has grown to over 1,000 employees worldwide and is worth over $1.5 billion. Brian was the recipient of the first Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award for e-commerce and has launched several successful companies, the most recent local market launch, all right here in Santa Barbara. Brian lives in Santa Barbara with his wife, Chari, and his son, David. I don't know if they're here, but if they are, we have seats for you down in the front. And uh, Brian loves surfing, free diving, and anything else that gets him in the salt water. And we're so thankful and happy to have him here this evening, Brian Coriad. Thank you, Melissa, and thank you, uh, Brian, for being here tonight, and thank all of you for coming. It's great to see all of you, and so many of my students, and I'm sure students from other classes, we welcome you, and of course, members of the community as well. So uh, I hope tonight's going to be interesting and worthwhile for everybody. Um, I have had an opportunity to meet with Brian about a week ago and have lunch, and we got a chance to chat again this evening before the event. And, uh, I'm struck by the fact that he is just uh, really down to earth. I really like him because he's a surfer, like kind of like me. <laughs> and, um, and yet, uh, through all this humility and kind of common sense that he's shared with us, he has an incredible history and track record of business success. So again, welcome, uh, Brian. And so let's get started tonight. Thanks for having me. Thank you. You're Thanks most guys welcome. For sure. Uh, Brian, I was struck the other day in our meeting by your personal story, and I think maybe if you would be kind enough to kind of share a little of your personal story as a young man and you're getting started and uh, share that with the audience tonight, I think they would benefit from hearing a little of that. Okay. Well, I guess my personal story uh, would probably start in uh, grade school. Uh, I was not like the other kids. I had dyslexia. I didn't know it at the time because back then you were just dumb. And I had a lot of trouble with reading, a lot of trouble with writing, and a lot of trouble with arithmetic. In fact, I couldn't, and still can't today, remember my multiplication table. So I couldn't advance in mathematics. So mathematics was difficult for me. I didn't have computers. I didn't have spell checkers. I couldn't spell. It's just all the classic dyslexia symptoms. So when I graduated uh, from high school, barely, barely, I went to a technical school to learn technical electronics. And a funny thing happened there, which is uh, I was surrounded by some of the people I went to school with, a lot of the nerds, as we call them back then, or geeks, as we call them now. And these are guys that were actually interested in engineering, interested in electronics. And it became quickly apparent that it, I was one of the leading students in the class. And the reason why I was one of the leading students is because the teacher had taught us to use a slide rule. Now, a slide rule is basically a primitive calculator, but it was, we had calculators back then, believe it or not, but it was uh, given me the ability to visualize the mathematics. And dyslexics are very visual thinkers. So if I can visualize it, I can get very good at it. And then I learned to read electronic circuitry, and what I found was that I could understand circuitry at a glance that would take people years to understand. And later on in life, I would work with engineers who would design the circuitry, and there were times when I'd go back and I'd explain to them why it was working or why it wasn't working, because I could actually see an electronic circuit and I could visualize it. So that was kind of the start of my career. And uh, so that took me from New York, where I grew up, uh, moved out to California, and worked for some defense contractors, and then ended up moving to Spain when I was about 20 years old for a job opportunity. And uh, that's where I met my beautiful wife. She's from Spain. And, uh, and then spent five years there, learned Spanish, had a great time, and came back to Santa Barbara. We ended up in Santa Barbara because I got a job in Goleta. 
And we immediately, of course, like everybody else, fell in love with Santa Barbara. So my wife said, you know, I never want to leave Santa Barbara. I never want to leave this place. It's gorgeous. It's got the Spanish influence. It's got Fiesta. Uh, how can we stay? And I told her, you know, houses are nearly $300,000, and there's no way anybody with a job can afford $300,000. And so we put our heads together and we started to save our money and I started to max out all my credit and get more credit cards and pool our money together, which probably totaled maybe $20,000, $30,000. And I volunteered for a layoff, one of the many layoffs at Raytheon, and we started our own business in our garage. And that was our first company. So that's kind of the beginning of it. How, how did you overcome these learning disabilities? I mean, if you struggled in school, mm -hmm. how did those uh, learning disabilities become more of a strength, do you think, in your technical career? Well, I think it's about getting to know yourself, you know, and all of us, and I work with lots of different people, and, and I recognize that we all have very different minds, and, uh, you know, once you get to know yourself and you know your strengths and weaknesses, then you could start to use tools. And tools started to come out. When, when the word processor and then the computer came out for writing, I was all of a sudden, I had a spell checker. I could actually spell. And I didn't have to worry about my lousy handwriting because I could type. And I could cobble together a story so if I were a good communicator, now I could take that and put that on paper. Whereas before, when I had to struggle with the handwriting, I had to struggle with the spelling, I had to struggle with the sentence structure, Etc. it didn't allow me to get to just telling the story, okay? Calculators, spreadsheets, okay? Of, of all the things that I learned, I mean, to, to use a spreadsheet is absolutely critical, especially in business. Absolutely, so what made you think when you took the layoff at uh, Raytheon that you were ready to be a business owner? Well, I think, uh, we wanted to sink or swim. We saved our money, we maxed out our credit cards, and we said, you know, we're either gonna sink or we're gonna swim. We're gonna uh, be successful, we're gonna grow a company, or we're going to move to Illinois or something like that, and where people can afford a home and you know, when just a regular day job. And uh, I guess it was really confidence in myself, and I owe that to my parents. You know, my parents somehow, through all my struggles in school, had always convinced me that I could do absolutely anything. And, Somehow I believed it. They got me to believe that. And, you know, nine-tenths of, you know, of all these struggles is belief. And if you don't believe it, you can't do it. You know, like Henry Ford said, you know, whether you believe that you can or you believe that you can't, you're probably right. And I'm a true believer in that. And, you know, so everything I do, I completely believe in it. And because of that, largely because of that, it happens. So early on, in, what were the skills that you felt you lacked when you started that business, and how did you compensate for that? Well, it turned out I was a very good writer. My first business was a company called Enterprising Solutions. And what that was, we put together a, uh, a catalog. We, when I say we, it was mostly me with some people helping me. Uh, and we put together a catalog, a 32-page catalog that we started to distribute and sell home-based uh, business-type books. And uh, so, I've learned over time to surround myself with people who are smarter than me in every sense of the word. Okay, so, you know, when you start a business, it's you, and you're wearing the accounting hat, and you're wearing the CEO hat, and the CTO hat, and you're everything. You do everything from top to bottom. But I'm pretty good at all of these things, but I'm not excellent at any of them. So when I build a business, and I started with the first business, the first thing I would look for, well, who's gonna do my accounting? Because I didn't like accounting. I, I, I took a class actually here at City College to do accounting and I learned, okay, here's how you do it. I never want to do that again. So who's <laughs> going to do that for me? Okay. But, but I understand it. Okay, that's great. So find an accountant. And then, uh, you know, it would be somebody who would do graphic design. Well, I wasn't good in graphic design. I was an artist. So I would find somebody to do that. And I'd take off my graphic design hat and pass it to them. Right. When I find uh, somebody who's better at writing, I take off my writer's hat and I give it to them at sales, I take out my sales hat and I give it to them. So in, in building businesses, I believe in surrounding yourself with people who are smarter than you are. Okay. You know? And thankfully they're not that hard to find for me anyway. Oh, so. that, that's a, a great advice. I'm, I'm thrilled that you took an accounting class here at the college. It says speaks to our accounting faculty for sure. 
Um, I, as I was doing my research, um, I'm using uh, social websites that I tell my students I don't know how to use and I'm finding out that maybe I do. And I noticed on your LinkedIn account that you say under your education that you completed your education through Bizarrely School of Hard Knocks. And I'm not sure our audience will know who uh, James Zarley is, so maybe you can give them a little bit of an overview of him. But my, my question really is, is what lessons did he teach you that were so critical to your success? Yeah, well, Jim Zarley, uh, Jim Zarley is one of the original investors in ValueClick. And uh, kind of an interesting story, when I got introduced to Jim Zarley, uh, it was through my original event and investor, Bob Lepo. And he, he brought me up to Best Internet, where Jim Zarley was running the company. And Jim Zarley was in a board meeting. And he interrupted Jim Zarley and said, you got to meet this guy. He's got a great idea. This value click thing is going to be big. And at that time, I think we were doing you know, $15,000 a month. So uh, Jim Zarley came out because Bob Lepo was an investor in his company. And as a, out of respect, he did that. And he came out, and I told him the story. And he said, and I said, well, what's your burn rate? I said, well, well we're profitable. Well, what do you mean you're profitable? I said, profitable. He says, wait right there. And he gets up and he goes into the boardroom and he takes the entire board of this company out and he says, tell them what you told me. I said, profitable? He says, yeah, that's it. You see, <laughs> an internet company can be profitable. And he said, I'm putting $50,000 in this company. I suggest every one of you do the same thing. And pretty much all of them did. And that's because Jim Zarley knows about profitability. Jim Zarley came from a turnaround CEO background. So they would send Jim Zarley in when the investors were afraid of losing their last dime on a particular company, and he would go in and he would figure out how to make that company profitable, and he turned it around. So when Jim Zarley invested in ValueClick, he thankfully became my mentor. And he sat down with me and you know, he said, okay, so these are your numbers? And I said, yeah. And he says, oh, so you're gonna grow 20% uh, into Infinium? I said, well, yeah. He says, no, no, you're not. He says, that's not the way it works. Here's how you're going to do it. And he started to show me using a spreadsheet. And we actually, you know, would pencil it out first, and then we'd put it into a spreadsheet. And he showed me how to build the business with an eye on profitability, always with an eye on profitability. And don't just go out and pour money into the marketplace and spend money on advertising on some big idea. You have to have an eye on profitability. So let's get it to, you have it at $30,000 a month and it's profitable? Great, let's start spending $50,000 a month in advertising. And your revenue should start to increase. And at some point, you're gonna come back to profitability. So you, you're able to go negative and go into the red, but with a clear plan towards profitability. And then you get profitable every quarter. So let's put $50,000 a month, and let's see if we can get up to $80,000 a month in revenues, and at that point we become break even, and then the next month we become profitable, and then the next month we get a little more profitable, and then let's take a little more money and put it in advertising and start to grow it. So by stepping the company up in, these, in this fashion, it did a couple of things. It gave you a good sense, it allowed you to sleep at night, and Jim Zarley taught me that sleeping at night when you're an entrepreneur is a luxury. And if you've got <laughs> investors calling you, and you've got customers calling you, uh, you know, and you're not making money, you're losing money, and you're worried about making payroll, and you're worried about raising money, you're not going to sleep at night. And, and I guess really what he taught me at the end of the day is how to sleep at night. And how you sleep at night is you keep control of your finances, you keep control of your company, and you grow it in such a way that, okay, we're profitable in March, now we're, we're negative in April, May, June, July, we're profitable in August, now we're negative in September, negative, and then if something happens, the market changes, some, something weird happens, which does all the time in business, you can always go back to your model two months ago. So rather than go have it going out and needing to raise capital and have your hat in, the hand, in your hand, as he would say, begging uh, you know, it, and up on Sand Hill Road up in San Francisco where all these venture capital or vulture capital firms are, <laughs> you're in a position of power. You're in a position that says, yeah, I may take your money, but what do you bring along with that money? And operating from a position of power, operating from a position of a clear path to profitability is really at the essence amongst millions of other things of what Jim Zarley taught me. Awesome, uh, I, wanna, I wanna step back from that for a second because okay. I do wanna talk more about value click. But again, my, my understanding from our conversations is you start this new business after giving up a job at Raytheon mm -hmm 
And you're basically, if I understand you correctly, in a, in a publishing business, yeah. you're, you're publishing stuff. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, an idea for value click apparently jumps into your head. This is one of those questions I warned you about. <laughs> and you're not a techie. You're not a tech guy. How did that happen? How did you go from making publishing stuff to saying, here's this incredible opportunity to do something on the internet, and I really am not a tech guy, and I don't really know anything about the internet. How did that happen? Okay, so <laughs> how did that happen? It's such a long, strange story. So uh, Enterprising Solutions was this publishing company, and, and we actually would buy the rights of these books, and we'd, we'd, we'd sell them through our catalogs, and we, had, we were shipping out, you know, my wife and I, were, we were stuffing envelopes and shipping catalogs all weekend, all night, every night. And when I quit my job, we were doing it full time. We hired our first employee and we were starting to gain, you know, six, seven, eight hundred dollars a week and, and most of that going to the bottom line so we could start to live again and, and have a little bit of money to spend. We upgraded to a two bedroom apartment from a one bedroom apartment. And I got a call one day from a guy who says, hey, I've got your catalog in front of me and I think it's really cool. I said, okay, great. You want to order something? He says, no, actually, I want to put you on the internet. And this is 1994. And I said to him, well, what's the internet? <laughs> <laughs> and he says, well, the internet is great, and 40 million people are going to come to the internet, and everybody in the world is going to be on this internet thing. And, and, and he started talking about email, and well, what's email? And, and, and he had to kind of talk me through it. So I ended up, I said, well, what, what are you proposing? He said, because he explained the internet concept to me. I said, great, I, I wouldn't have to ship catalogs because my catalog would be online and available to 40 million people. And I wouldn't have to ship the books because they'd be able to download them. And those are my biggest expenses, printing and postage. So what do I need to do? He says, well, you're going to go into this Tar Heel mall and we're going to be the biggest thing on the internet. We're going to sell all sorts of products. And I said, well, what does it cost me? He says, well, it'll be $50 set up and then 5%. And after a year, it'll be a minimum $50 a month. I said, okay, fine. So he put me on the internet and I got on the internet. I, I went out and literally bought a computer and I pieced it together from what we could find. I think I spent about $200 to piece together this computer. It didn't even have a color monitor. And plugged in, I saw there was my catalog. I'm like, oh, great. You know? so, Nobody came and nobody came. So we continued to build the business through the traditional methods and running classified ads. And a year went by, and a year goes by pretty quickly. And I get a call from this guy. He says, hey, yeah, this is Harold from the Tar Heel Mall. And he says, uh, you know, you're going to need to start paying your minimum of $50 a month next month. And I said, well, I haven't gotten any sales. This hasn't done anything for me. And he says, well, has anybody been to your website? I said, I don't know. Can you check that? So that was 1995. Can you check that? And he says, uh, sure, we have logs. And I said, well, there was one person there yesterday, and there was two people on Sunday, and one the day before that. And I said, well, that was me. Said, <laughs> <laughs> Just updating it to make sure it's still alive. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he says, uh, well, you know, I, I said, well, how do I get people? You told me 40 million people were going to be coming to my website. And they're not there. <laughs> I'm there. <laughs> and he said, I said, well, what do you do to get people on your website? Well, you know, you have to, you know, put, put it in the newspaper and you have to put it on business cards and leave it on, on people's windshield. And he gave me all these ideas. I just went, you know, I don't think so. It just doesn't sound right. So I started to think about, well, how do I get online and how do I search for things online? And there was this new directory called Yahoo. And I went to this Yahoo directory, which, which was pretty sparse, run by a couple of kids up at Stanford. And I got on there, and there was no way to put my website on there. So I sent an email to the webmaster. And he sends me an email back. And he says, well, you know, uh, send me a copy of your catalog. And I sent him a copy of the catalog. He goes, show me the web page. And I show him the web page. And, and he said, call me. And I called him, traded a few phone calls, because I'm calling a dorm phone. And back then, they didn't all have cell phones, and they shared a wall phone, <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> So I talked to the webmaster and Jerry Yang. And Jerry Yang tells me, oh, this is pretty cool what you're doing here. Yeah, we'll put you on Yahoo tomorrow morning. And I said, 
Okay, great, thank you very much. And of course, Jerry Yang was nobody, I was nobody, we we're all nobodies. And next morning, I look on Yahoo, hey, I'm listed in business opportunities and home-based business category. And I was literally the first one there. And funny thing happened, the next day I got an order. And then the next day I got two orders. And I said, wow, this is cool, it's actually working. People are ordering my products online. So what else can I do? So I started to get up every morning. I said, well, where else can I get linked up? And I went to all these arcane, pre-Google days, search engines and directories. And there was Aliweb and AltaVista and Lightghost and there were, there were many of them. But day by day, the traffic on my website started to increase and I started to be able to take my business completely online. And then I had been listed in about 50 or 60 different directories. And then my wife gave me a great idea. She says, well, if you're gonna need it, everybody's gonna need it. I said, yeah, you're right. Well, I've got this gal Yvette that works for me. She's my only employee. She could probably repeat what took me hundreds of hours to do on behalf of a business and get on the computer and fill out forms on behalf of the client. And she could, she could repeat that in probably two, three hours. I pay her $15 an hour, I'll charge, I'll charge $89 for 50 directors. So I put together a website, AAA Internet Promotions, because believe it or not, back in those days in the internet, that was SEO. AAA got you right to the top of Yahoo, got you right to the top of all these directories. So, so I, I put it out there and a funny thing happened. In two weeks, I had a 200 order backlog. So I was horrified. No way she could keep up with that. So we started hiring people. Now we're still in this two-bedroom apartment. So I double the price in a panic. So I go from 89 to about $180, 50 directors. And in three weeks, I had a 300 order backlog. So I doubled the price again and finally stemmed the flow. And long story short, by the time we left the two-bedroom apartment and we had people coming in, we were hiring uh, these mostly housewives who had computers at home, dial-up connections, filling out these forms on the internet, by the time we got to our first office in the Granada building, we had over 40 employees. And then it just went absolutely skyrocketed from there. So that bought us our first house. All of a sudden, the enterprising solution thing was like, God, all that work for 500 bucks, forget it. You know, and then we're making a lot of money over here. So I shut that down and started to do this new business, and, uh, which was AAA in their promotions. And AAA in their promotions, you know, I, I don't even know how much money it was making. It was all on cash flow and we were just, you know, I owned the whole thing, I was making money, I was making payroll, running advertisements, and uh, basically it was the first directory listing service on the internet. And then the competition came, and the competition came and started to drive up my ad rates on all my great advertising venues, and they started to drive down my profits. And it, it crushed me over a period of about three or four months. I went from 40 people down to 30 people, I had to lay off more people and I was juggling bills. Finally, I had to have pretty much a massive layoff, you know, I mean massive meaning, you know, 20 people at a time and just absolutely revamped the company because I didn't have financing. I didn't know anything about financing at that time. So we reinvented the company as WebIgnite and we became one of the first SEO companies, search engine optimization companies. And we were doing advertising placements for our customers. And we were doing basically anything for a buck that you could do on the internet when it had to do with advertising. And I got an idea, the value click idea, when all of these companies, I saw all these websites coming online and I said, wow, there are gonna be millions of websites coming online and nobody can buy advertising for them because they don't have enough traffic. The only place you could buy advertising is AOL, Yahoo, uh, MSNBC, things like that, okay, just big properties. How can we get this critical mass together, bring everybody together, and sell it as a package to a big network? That would be fantastic. And not, let's do something different. Everybody's charging by the impression, by how many people see your advertisement, let's charge by the click. So let's charge 10 cents a click, and we'll pay the publishers, or the website owners, five cents a click. So you put an ad on, on the Bonnie Chavez webpage, and, uh, we'll pay you five cents for everybody who clicks on it. And then we'll charge an advertiser 10 cents. So I didn't have any money to do this, of course. And I uh, went to a guy who had done some programming for me, uh, Michael Bueno, and I said, hey, Michael, I'm not a programmer. I don't have any money to pay you. If you build this thing, I think I can sell it. And if I sell it, I'll give you 10% of the top line. 
and that's what I'm offering you. And he said, okay. And a few months later, we launched Value Click. And since we already had a customer base, it got some immediate traction. Mm -hmm. And I, so. I want to talk more about that, but I, mm -hmm. I'd like to ask a question about search engine optimization since okay. you mentioned it a few times. Uh, many students here and in my classes are very interested in starting their own businesses, mm -hmm. and many of them are interested in starting web-based businesses. As a matter of fact, my own daughter runs a business, and she gets most of her clients, if not all, through her web page. What can you tell young people today about the importance of search engine optimization and what they should be doing to more effectively compete in that arena as a web-based business? Yeah, well, search engine optimization in 2012 has really changed. Uh, search engine optimization is really, uh, you know, 95% of all searches go through Google. And Google has been changing their algorithms lately. And Google is just getting plain smarter. You can't trick Google. You can't just go out there and you can't just build links back to your website. And you can't buy links on link farms. And you can't do all these things that work just fine up until, up until this year, really. What you need to do is generate quality content. And you need to become a leader in your space. So whatever it is you're talking about, and that has to do with social media as well, because Google is looking at how many people liked your article, how many people shared your article, how many retweets you got, and this type of thing. They're looking at social signals, and they're looking at uh, authorship, and they're looking at how many LinkedIn followers do you have, and then does that tie with your Google authorship? And so if you if you're, have a Google author tag and it, your little photo comes up next to your articles, well, your relevance is going to be based on how many followers you have on LinkedIn, how many Google circles you're involved in, how many people have recommended you, how many people have retweeted you, how many people have shared. So SEO has really taken a, a huge turn this year, and it's become much more difficult to do and much more difficult to repeat. So there are a lot of SEO companies out there. You in also mentioned the other day, I think it's something for... Uh, business people and students to hear. You said the other day, for every review online, you need to respond. Yeah, that's becoming more and more the case. And reviews is, is part of social media. You know, 86% of people who, are, who investigate companies online right now are looking at the reviews. And it's becoming common practice to respond to all of these reviews. So if somebody uh, puts a review about your restaurant, you have to respond, even positive or negative. Thank you for coming, we're glad you enjoyed your meal, or sorry you weren't happy, next time please come see the manager, uh, we're gonna try to fix this. And people are beginning to expect that, and that's becoming the new word of mouth online, is the reviews. And so, right now it's very big with, with uh, restaurants and hotels, but it's becoming more so with, uh, like on uh, Angie's List, they have contractors, and Manta.com has other businesses, and, and Yelp is starting to add more business types. As well. So, so is, is responding to these reviews becoming kind of the PR effort in most companies' it's becoming, marketing It's plans? becoming a very important part of the PR. Okay. You know, a company now needs to really monitor the conversation that's going on about their business. It used to be, uh, you know, just a couple of years ago, and, and still today in, in most businesses, which is changing rapidly, is that a company doesn't know the conversation that's going on about their business. They have to send out secret shoppers and they have to interview people and do focus groups and find out what people think. But now the company has the luxury of being able to get online and to listen to the conversation and then participate in the conversations. Uh, it's very important, thank you. Um, in this question, if there's any dates or numbers that are wrong, please feel free to connect, uh, correct me, uh, Brian. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, you said that you kind of started in 1994, but ValueClick really kind of got off the ground in 1997. Mm -hmm. And according to my research, by 2000, three years later or thereabouts, you have revenues in excess of $56 million. Mm -hmm. And then the company goes public in uh, 2000. And in September of 2001, I think, if my research is correct, you leave or no longer affiliated with Value Click. Mm -hmm. That's about four years as I count it, or yeah. if you, we count 1994, that's about six years. Yeah. Again, one of those questions. Mm -hmm. This seems like a real short period of time to achieve an amazing amount of success. Mm -hmm. So my question is, was it that easy? Or second, are you a one-hit wonder? Is that it? 
<laughs> well, I hope not. Uh, was it that easy? No, it was really hard. You know, and I, I actually, I have recently started another business that um, Melissa mentioned, Local Market Launch, and I'm starting to remember how hard it was. And it's, it's a lot of fun to have a startup, and we were talking about it the other day in a meeting, and, and I think Gideon, my chief marketing officer, said, yeah, a lot of fun in hindsight. Mostly in hindsight, it's a lot of fun, kind of like high school, you know? Looking back at it, it was a lot of fun, but when you're in it, you know, it, it's, a, it's a grind. And I'm going through it again, and I'm starting to remember the stories, and I think it's kind of like you forget. It, it was hard. In fact, I took, I basically took about 10 years off for the most part. You know, when we took ValueClick public, I made enough money to never have to work again. So, you know, I started traveling. I learned to fly airplanes. I started, you know, buying commercial buildings, hotels, and shopping malls, and just vacation rentals, and building houses, and doing all these things. And, uh, and a lots and lots of travel. And I still stayed involved in business from an advisor standpoint. I stayed involved in business from an investor standpoint. And I had some businesses that didn't need employees. But uh, it's hard to do it. And it takes uh, belief. As I mentioned before, you have to absolutely believe you can do it. It'd be for so many reasons. Because I couldn't convince you that I could do it if, you don't believe that, if I don't believe that I can do it. And I can't convince my employees that they can do it and that we can do it if I don't totally believe that we can do it. So, but for some reason, it's easy for me, that part, because mm -hmm. I believe it. And, uh, and then you have to do the hard work. And you have to just keep kicking that can down the road, no matter what happens. And you have to overcome barriers on a daily basis. And you have to become comfortable with being uncomfortable. And you have to get used to not knowing answers because you don't know any of the answers. And we're paving the road while we're driving on it. So it's not an easy thing to do. But you know, I've got different metaphors and different theories, but it's, it's like if you're in a room and you're trying to escape from the room and there's five people in that room and you're all banging on different, different walls, you'll never get through the wall. But if you can get everybody banging on one wall, at some point you get through that wall. And if you could focus that energy and get everybody banging in one spot, you'll get through the wall even sooner. So as a CEO, I surround myself with people who are greater than I am in all aspects, in their particular aspect. And then I, my job then is to be the cheerleader, to surround myself with great people, be the cheerleader, and focus them in one direction so that hopefully we're banging on that little piece of the wall and we, get, and we break through. And in our business now, we're breaking through. I, I don't so, want to leave that topic for just a second. Sure. Uh, there's two questions. Uh, my first is, is where does, where does that drive come from in you? Were you passionate about the business or were you just passionate about succeeding at whatever you were doing? Because in a lot of the textbooks today about entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. there's this kind of list of characteristics that you've got to have. And mm -hmm. I, I quite frankly don't believe that. Mm -hmm. So what, what gave you that drive? What gave you that passion, that persistence when things became tough? You know, it, it's because, you know, people ask me, why, why are you doing it again? You don't need to do this. You don't need to build another company. Why are you risking, you know, I put over a million dollars cash of my own money in this, in this business. Why are you doing that? Why are you putting that at risk? I love to build the business. It's something I love to do. I've built, you know, five or six businesses now of different sizes. Value Click being the one everybody knows about, but there, there were others. And it's something that I love to do. Some people love to rebuild cars, and some people love to build houses, and some people build furniture. I love to build, and so it comes with challenges, and, and nothing that is easy is rewarding, right? It, it's when it's difficult that it becomes rewarding. You, you climb to the top of Mount Whitney, you're not because it's easy. You don't go up there for the view. You know, you, you can go on Google Earth and get a good view, you know? But you climb up that mountain because it's hard and it's challenging, and you overcome the barriers and you overcome your internal barriers to get there. So I. I, I really okay. liked the uh, the metaphor of banging on the wall. Um, as a manager then, and as a leader of an entrepreneurial venture, how do you let go, how do you empower others when really you're laying it all out there on the line? Well, you have to. It's, it's really, in my opinion, micromanaging doesn't work, not with great people. If you want to surround yourself with great people, you have to treat them as great people, and you have to lead them as great people, 
And everybody, nobody's perfect. Everybody is a work in progress. And everybody, there's not one person in my organization, including me, that's perfect. None of us do it. But we're a family and we empower each other and we kind of treat each other as a family. So if somebody has, you know, a week with no sales, you can't, you know, poke at him and make fun of him and a week with great sales, now he's a hero and things like that. You have to accept people on their good days and their bad days and their good weeks and their bad weeks. And you have to uh, empower them by, by sharing the vision with them. And if they're, if they're sharing in the vision, they understand the mission of the company, then they're empowered to make decisions because they can say, well, Brian's not around or I don't want to go to him. How do I make this decision? Well, you make that decision based on, does that bring me closer? Which choice brings me closer to achieving our mission? Okay. And, and that empowers people. And, and, and then I help, my job as a CEO is to help people succeed. I, I know it might be just a little off topic, but is it your opinion and experience that people that come to work and really want to be a part of that team pounding on that wall mm -hmm. are more interested in the work than they are the pay? Or is the primary motivator, you think, the pay? It's not the pay. Not the pay. Uh, I believe that the best motivator for people, again, great people, there are people that aren't that great, and, and they're, they're, they're motivated you know, strictly by pay and greed and things like that. And, and there's a place for that, too. I mean, there's a place for sales and, and just hungry people out there selling. And, and you know, there's a place for that, and there's nothing wrong with pay. But the greatest motivator I find is appreciation, motivating and appreciating people and thanking them and saying, you did a great job, you know, thank you, you know, appreciate them. And people... People love appreciation. I agree. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, what kind of uh, suggestions would you give to our students today who are facing a lot of challenges in their lives? Uh, many of them, when they're looking at the end of their education, not looking at job opportunities out there. What kinds of advice do you give them to, to persist, to continue to knock down walls, to continue to, to move forward? Well, I, I think what you have to do is, is really you have to have goals and you have to work towards your goal. So, you know, if you're just graduating from school and you, your goal is to run a successful company, well, that goal is out here. You can, you can decide that goal and you can visualize that in your mind and you should often visualize, you know, what that feels like, what it looks like, what, you know, what it smells like, the whole thing. You have to really believe sure. it and understand it and then you can get, the, get there. But then once you have that goal in mind, you need to get up every day and you need to take that one step that gets you a little bit closer to that goal. That one step, because it takes a million little steps to get to those goals. You don't just get there. You don't just go flying up to that goal and, oh yeah, now I'm running a successful company. Every day I get up, I, I do a lot of thinking about the future and I think about it and I design it and then I get back to the present moment. I say, okay, and I get up in the morning and I go, what today do I need to do to get me closer to that goal of having a $300 million company? You know? And, well, today I need to go down and visit this guy. I need to tell this guy, and I need to make sure that my salespeople are doing this. I need to hire two more people. You know? And I do what I need to do today. So what I try to do is really you know, stay in the moment and do what I need to do today and always, again, going back towards that mission, back towards that goal, and just just know it's gonna take micro steps. It's, it's like you're walking across the United States and you're gonna to walk to Washington, D.C. You know, you're not just gonna get there. You're gonna take one step at a time. And as long as every step or most steps are in that direction, you'll get there. Do you think uh, that having that goal and in your experience, your capacity to effectively pitch that vision and that goal to others is a critical skill? Yes. Absolutely. And so how, how did you develop that skill? I'm a pretty good storyteller, so that's, that's probably part of it. Uh, I'm somewhat of a visionary. I like to say I think of things about two seconds before everybody else because, um, you know, I, I don't think light years ahead. It's about two seconds before everybody else because everybody's right here. And... Uh, 
and I really start running. I just start running in the direction. I decide the direction I want to go, and I, I just start running in that direction, and I see what happens, because you have to do something to get some type of, of input. I could have sat home thinking, when I decided to do this again, which happened pretty much on my 50th birthday, I decided, you know, or, or thereabouts, you know, 50, I could do one more in four years, my son's in high school, we're not traveling, sold the airplane, you know, so, you know, what can, what can I do? And, you know, just stepping towards those goals is, is, is what I need to do. And so you gotta jump in and you gotta become part of it. You have to just start, you have to just do it because you don't see the opportunities unless you're in the game. You have to get in the game. You can't look at the internet and investigate this, investigate that, investigate the other, and say, yeah, that's interesting, that's cool, and maybe I'll do this. You have to get in that game. And when you get in that game, then there's so many opportunities that you have to maintain a focus and go, oh, I have to stay here. That's nice, and that's nice, and this is a great opportunity, but I'm going right here. This is my opportunity. So let's pick up on that for a second. Um, Again, at lunch the other day, you said something that you somewhat repeated that you, you see opportunities about two seconds before everybody else. And uh, I'm, I'm wondering, um, how do you find these new opportunities? And do you think it's luck? Do you think it's intuition? Do you think it's street smarts that you've developed over time? A natural curiosity that you're constantly looking for those opportunities? Or is it simply a matter that you pay attention? I think I pay attention, I have a natural curiosity, and I think it's because, you know, largely because of my dyslexia. I think I'm just a very visual thinker, and dyslexics are, you know, many, many, many entrepreneurs are dyslexic, and ADD are both, many. You know, I, I could go down lists, you can look them up online, but it, it's, we somehow have the ability to see connections of things better, uh, see the connections of things that aren't visually connected to everybody, to, to everybody else. Other people just don't see those connections and to put those things together. So I think by paying attention, being in the game, and, and just trying to figure out and feel it out, and then it's the gut, you know, and the gut is a huge part, which is intuition. You know, I think the gut, sure. intuition is about the same thing. And all the great people, business people that I know are people that operate largely from their gut and from their intuition. You've got to go with your gut. Whenever I get into a struggle between my mind and my gut, my gut wins, you know, and I go with my intuition, and, and it works. So what are you paying attention to today? What are things that you're paying attention to? Uh, from a market standpoint or in general? Just in general. I'm just curious to, to know what you're kind of looking at on this horizon. The economy's not particularly good. Mm -hmm. Seems like there's some real challenges for the country. Uh, globally, yeah. there's some real challenges. What are you paying attention to? And, and, and are opportunities like the one that you discovered and turned into such an incredibly successful business like mm -hmm. Value Click, are those same opportunities out there for these young people today? There's so many more. It's unbelievable. Yeah, it's mind boggling to me the amount of opportunities that are out there on, on the internet in the space and the whole, you know, it, the internet, the life, life and the internet are intertwining, right? It's the social media, it's the, your cell phone, it's, it's everything. And, and, and there's nothing but opportunity out there. And, and it's for somebody to grab an opportunity and run with it, you know, if you do a good job and, and you knock at that wall and you keep everybody knocking at that same wall for a while, there's a damn good chance you're gonna make a lot of money doing it. And there, there's a ton of opportunity. It's not opportunity for everybody, unfortunately. It's not opportunity for these poor people that are laid off in middle America that don't know what they're gonna do next, that really can't hold a candle to anybody in this room when it comes to you know, operating in a computer or a mouse. I mean, there are people, uh, unfortunately, you know, even 40 years old, 30 years old, you know, that are just so technology adverse that they're cut out of that whole opportuni opportunity, uh, opportunity party, you know? It, but there's a ton of opportunity, but it's, it's technology and it's, uh, it's online. And then of course there's other non-technical opportunities as well, but that's what I pay attention to. So we, should we be encouraging college students to become more tech savvy? Should we encourage them to take more technology related courses? I would say yeah, no question about it. My son is in the Mad Academy over at uh, 
Santa Barbara High School. And I was so happy when I walked into that MAD Academy and saw a computer on every desk. I said, well, yeah, this is what the workspace looks like. You know, why, you know, why are we teaching the way we've always taught when the world has changed so much? Why are we teaching, you know, algebra, geometry, you know, mathematics when, and we don't teach them how to run a spreadsheet? I mean, to me, that's ludicrous. You gotta run a spreadsheet. You gotta be able to, you know, that's just, that's just basic arithmetic. That's arithmetic, arithmetic I can do, you know? Right. And, and it's so important. I balance checkbooks, things like that, you know, P and L's and, mm -hmm. and balance sheet. I think that, we need to promote creativity, we need to promote technology, and uh, we need to promote, promote entrepreneurship. And those three things are what Americans are uniquely gifted at as a nation. And, and those are things, I don't think we need to push math for everybody, every student, okay? For engineering, for, for scientific, obviously. But for every student, no. For, there's marketing skills, there are, there are technology skills. I cannot get qualified people that I'm looking for today here in Santa Barbara. I, I'm looking, we are casting a net. We are looking for great people, okay? If anybody is looking. And we're casting a wide net and now bring me some better people, bring me some better people. I need people, I need engineers who are hard to get. They're making a ton of money. Uh, Good salespeople, good business development people are hard to get, and they make a ton of money. And a startup environment, and in Santa Barbara, where you know it, it's a tough, tough place to recruit, but it's so important. If if I was a small business owner today and using the web either to enhance my business or it was a web-based business, mm -hmm. how can I use that technology to more effectively market my business? What should I be doing? In a small business? It, yeah. yeah, well, it depends on the type of small business. The, the company we started, Local Market Launch, is uh, dedicated to bringing small businesses online. Uh, the yellow pages have always been kind of the mainstay for service businesses, especially. You want to get your carpet cleaned, or you need a plumber, or whatever, you open the yellow pages, and now that's dead. And that was the impetus for starting Local Market Launch and getting those businesses online. So. For each business, it's different. You know, the first thing is you have to be able to get found, and that's what we specialize in, and that's why we specialize in it. I'm kind of a simple, let's focus on this, get found. Yeah, we know we're gonna need, they're gonna need that because if you don't get found, you don't get the business. So, but as a business, you know, you should have a website, uh, and some businesses should be participating in social media. Some it may not be so important. Again, if you're if you're a carpet cleaner, you know, you might not have a lot to talk about. But if you're you know, uh, Soho or, or, or any of the clubs downtown, there's probably a lot to talk about and there's followers and, and you can send out, you know, happy hour specials on Twitter and there are all these creative things that you can do, but you need to get online and start to engage your customers through social media or through email and, and really get with the technology. You know, 63% of businesses in the United States don't even have a website, 63%. And that's unbelievable it because, is. you know, they don't exist. So when somebody searches for a plumber in Santa Barbara, if you're not there, if you don't have the website, if you're not listed, you don't exist. And they go to somebody else. I, I think, if I'm paraphrasing you correctly from the other day, um, when we talked about these opportunities, your cell phone was on the, uh, the table and you pointed to the cell phone and you go, there are incredible an enormous amount of opportunities yeah. with this technology. That's right, enormous. Can you, can you expand on that a little bit or explain to the audience tonight what you were thinking? Well, you know, it, it, we're all, probably every person or damn near every person in this room has got a cell phone in their pocket and they have a smartphone. Most of them have smartphones and if they don't, they will. And they're using that to check to see if their airplane's on time, to see where they're gonna eat for dinner, see what's in the movies. It's becoming their interactive, uh, their interactive piece that they communicate with their friends, they're doing their email, they're doing their Facebook. And the amount of opportunity there is absolutely un incredible because it's just the birthplace of an industry. This whole, you know, the, the couple of facts is that the mobile, the mobile thing is brand new. It may not feel brand new, to a lot of people in this room, but it is, it's brand new. And we're on the leading edge of a giant bell curve 
of all these businesses, these 63% of businesses that have to get online to survive. And it's an exciting time. There's a lot of opportunity in, in that space alone. And there are many other spaces, you know, but this, you know, mobile is where it's at. And we're, we're all, we all have our mobile devices and, and who knows what they're gonna look like in five years. Absolutely, absolutely. Let's, let's go back and pretend just a little bit to local market launch, your newest endeavor. Um, I uh, took a look at that web page and I was struck by a, a comment that you made on there and this is a shortened version of what you said. You said simple things get complicated and complicated things don't get done. Yeah. I really liked that. That's and a big belief in mine. <laughs> yeah, and so I'm wondering where did that philosophy come from? What, what, what's driving that? Well, what drives that philosophy is experience and my experience in negotiating contracts and negotiating deals. You know, it, business to me, and, and business should be to everybody, I believe, about creating win-win relationships. It's about negotiating, it's about getting together a customer, a customer and a vendor, or two businesses, and they both offer value. And they, cre they create a win-win relationship. So in doing that, you need to negotiate contracts and you need to negotiate deals. And in doing that, I have found that whenever you start with something complicated, it never gets done. And simple deals get incredibly complicated. The business that we started, Local Market Launch, is very much similar to my original business, AAA Internet Promotions, because the internet is diverging from just Google. It's becoming Yelp and Foursquare, Merchant Circle, and everything else. And, and a lot of niche directories, depending on whether you're searching for a hotel or a plumber or a restaurant or a movie theater, you might use different apps and different technologies and different search portals. So, uh, you know, uh, businesses need to be in all those places, you know. So uh, share with us, if you can, in uh, these numerous negotiations that you've been in, involved in, how do you create that win-win? What, what, what were the strategies that you think worked for you? Well, I think you just need to wear the other person's shoes, you know. And, and what I try to do in negotiating contracts you know, uh, is to, to sit in the other person's shoes. Well, first thing I look in the contract is, do you have an easy out? And does my a partner in the contract have an easy out? First thing I look for, because the way I like to do it is, let's draw up the contract, let's go in, let's do our best to create a win-win situation. It's very likely we're gonna be off the mark, but if we each have an out, that encourages us to come back to this negotiating table and for you to say, you know what, it's really not working for us. Or I say, you know what, it's really more expensive than we thought it was gonna be. Well, let's renegotiate that, see if we can work together. And then if we can't work together, well, let's walk away, let's walk away friends and amicably. But I don't negotiate and sign contracts planning on lawsuits. I negotiate and sign contracts as for, the, my main purpose is to build a fence and to remember what we negotiated. Because when you're in negotiations, you talk about so many different possibilities and so many things. And I've had things where we just did a handshake. You say, yeah, we trust each other, we did a handshake. And then you forget what, you've, what, what, you, what you negotiated. And you have a different memory than I did. Sure. And then you can't come back. So you do need the contract. But I like to have loose contracts that, that promote win-win relationships and have easy outs so that, you know, after 30, you know, 30 day out, 60 day out, you know, if this isn't working, let's make it work or let's walk away. Very good advice. Thank you so much, Brian. Uh, it, it sounds like when you started uh, Value Click, you started with a vision, but maybe not necessarily a formal education as a in business mm -hmm. or maybe not even a business plan. Right. So what would you advise for somebody who's wanting to start a business today that may not have that formal education, may not have a plan? Would you say, yeah, let's do it, vision is enough, or what are the things you need to have in place in order to give this idea, this concept, this product a chance? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, a vision is important. You have to have a vision, you have to have a market, you have to have a business model, you have to have all those things. A, a business plan is important, a business plan is a tool. I found when I did ValueClick's business plan, ValueClick was my fourth business, and it was my first business plan. And I did the business plan, even though I'd read about it, and every business book you say you read says, yeah, make a business plan. And yeah, yeah, right, I'll get to it. And I never got to it. And with ValueClick, I was forced to do it because we wanted to raise money. And I found out what a great tool it is. 
and I'm refinding that out right now because I'm working on the business plan for a local market launch because we're about to go out and raise money. And I have it all up here, but now I'm forced to write that down. And I'm forced to justify every penny. I'm forced to get ready to answer to somebody and say, well, what about this? And what about that? And, and you need to be able to answer that stuff. So the business plan is a huge tool, not just to raise money, but it's a tool that forces you to really sit down and, and evaluate, well, what is the mission? Mm -hmm. And how are we going to get there? And what does that look like? And who are the competitors? It, it, it's it's a, a tool that, that forces you to put some structure around what you're doing. So yeah, you can wing it, and there are great entrepreneurs that wing it, and I'm good at winging it. And, and with Local Market Launch, I winged it for a while, and I said, okay, let's get a business plan, because I didn't really know what the business was going to be. Mm -hmm. And then when you do the business plan, have the understanding, in fact, you should know that you're wrong. Whatever you write down there, you're going to be wrong, because it's never the way you think it's going to be. No matter how good you are, those financials are going to be wrong. The business that we're in now, you don't know what business you're going to be in in two years. In local market launch, I know, I don't know what business we're going to be in two years. We're going to be search. We're going to be, mm -hmm. you know, local search optimization. That's that's the piece we're grabbing onto. But what does that mean? We don't know. We know what it means today. Okay. And we know how to take that revenue to the next levels. And But the ability to evolve the business and allow the business to evolve with the marketplace is critical. Well, and what do you think the people who you're going to share this business plan with in order to get funding, what do you think are the critical questions they're going to want you to have addressed or they might ask? How are you different is, is the one that, you know, I'm working hard on right now because, you know, it's hard to be different. It's hard to be better. How are you different? How are you better? And, and you should be different and you should be better. So, th so that's a piece that, that I don't want to say I'm struggling with, but that's a piece I need to be able to explain properly. Uh, they're going to ask about revenues, but it was a funny thing when I first raised money for ValueClick. I started to run into all these wealthy individuals who would interview me, some of them for hours, several times, etc. And a lot of them started off the conversation with, well, what does your mother do? What does your father do? Where did you grow up? Who are you? You know, and, and really finding out what you're made of because, and, I, and you've heard this and, and I started to hear it then, is that they don't bet on the track, they bet on the horse. And they want to know that they're investing in a person or a team that if this doesn't work, well, they're going to make something else work. They're going to take that million dollars and they're going to turn it to 10 million, you know, by making it work, whatever it takes. And they've got a great shot to do it. So, so I think what investors really look for is they look for the opportunity to multiply their investment, but they look to minimize that risk through believing in the plan and believing in the space and most of all, believing in the entrepreneur and the leadership of the company. Mm -hmm. how, how much uh, research has gone into the development of your plan? In other words, do you engage in significant market research as you're writing this before you started? Or again, are you working off of gut instinct here? Uh, a lot of it's gut instinct. Uh, there is a lot of market research about the market itself. You know, how Yellow Pages are, you know, losing ground and 63% of businesses don't have websites, et cetera. And there's a lot of stats and the growth of uh, the online sp ad spending for local businesses and brands and things like that. There's, so we don't actually do the research. It's out there. The, the yeah. internet's crawling with the research. Uh, and then, uh, but as far as developing the vision, you know, uh, we look at the space. We're in it every day. You know, every day I spend probably three or four hours a day, mm -hmm. reading about every one of my competitors, about everybody in this whole local space, as we're calling it now. It's kind of like a local space race. I mean, who's going who's gonna to get all these local businesses? 27 million of them. Is it going to be Facebook or Foursquare or Twitter or Google or, or, or Yelp or Manta? You know, and everybody's got their own different business models. And who's, who's going to gather that business and bring value to the local business owner? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's what we're starting to call the local space race. And who's going to figure that out? And, you know, I think we're going to. So. Well, I, I, it sounds like uh, what I've seen from your webpage and uh, you're from local market, uh, 
uh, your local market page, it looks like uh, launch you have some very significant uh, benefits that you offer that have certainly distinguished yourself. Um, I read a book a number of years ago and that I share sometimes with students. I'm not sure if you've ever heard or seen it. It's called The E-Myth. It's written by Michael Gerber. And, and one of the things that he says in his book that I like so much is he says that, uh, that the entrepreneur is three people in one. And he describes those three roles as only the Only three? Yeah, <laughs> only three, right. He describes it as the entrepreneur, as one, and, and that entrepreneur is the, the dreamer and the visionary. Uh, the second is the manager. That, that's the pragmatic, lives in the past, clings to the status quo, if you would. And the third is the technician, and he defines that person as the doer, the, thinker, the tinkerer, if you would. And I'm just wondering, does that make sense to you? And do you see yourself having to have carried out those roles in your businesses? Yeah, I carried out every role, you know what I mean? Because the entrepreneur wears every hat, right? And, 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 and like I said earlier, you know, so I started at the CEO hat, CMO, CTO, and, and, and as I find people better than me, I here, take this hat, here, take that hat, take that hat. And then you, you start to you surround yourself with people who are better than you. But, I, you know, I would, I would, wouldn't describe myself, you know, I wouldn't use that terminology probably for me. I would probably use, you know, uh, you know, what is my role? My role is the visionary. My role is the cheerleader. My role is the, uh, the team leader. And my role is to help everybody succeed and to surround myself with great people and then help them succeed. That's, that's my role, you know? So as far as technician, I'm sure, not sure where, where, what do you meant by that? Okay. Well, we talked the other day. You uh, expressed a lot of emotion when you talked about having to lay people off in your yeah. organizations. Yeah. And I'm wondering, what do you think uh, people that work for you would say about you as a manager or your leadership style? You know, I don't know. You know, uh, you know, it's hard to know what people are saying about you. you what know? do you hope they would say then? Uh, I hope that they would see wisdom in my decisions. You know, I mean. In, in this particular business, you know, we've had people that have come and gone. Some have come and left voluntarily uh, because it wasn't for them, and, and it wasn't. You know, the entrepreneur thing is not for everybody. The entrepreneur process, you know, you have to be very comfortable with, becoming, be, with being uncomfortable. You have to be comfortable not knowing all the answers. You have to be comfortable with not having all the materials that you need to get your job done. You know, when a salesperson comes to me and says, yeah, well, I need a brochure to, you know, so I can sell this product. And I'm like, yeah, you do. I mean, you know, I don't want people, I'm trying not to hire people to come with me with questions. I need people to come with me with solutions. Hey, I made this brochure, what do you think? Yeah, good, go, <laughs> sell the product. So, so as far as laying people off, you know, so we've had people, uh, you know, it, it's been a year, you know, not a lot of people, but a few people and, you know, uh, you know, that, that have left and a couple that didn't make it because it just wasn't the right fit. And, and the right fit is really about, we have 10 people at our company right now. Every one of those chairs has to have the right person for that job. Every one of them. If we're gonna be successful, it, one person is 10% of our workforce. Right. And if one person is not the right fit and they're not bad people, they're gonna be, they're smart people, they're intelligent people, it's just, we made a mistake, and it's their mistake as well as our mistake. They thought they could, they'd be good at it, and we thought they'd be good at it, and well, turns out it's not a good fit. And being a small company, we don't have other places to put them. Mm -hmm. But I agonize over letting people go, or even firing people that need to be fired for something malicious that they may have done. I agonize over it, and, and I lose a lot of sleep, and it's the worst part of the job. Yeah, <laughs> indeed, indeed. Yeah. But, but I've seen so many companies in trouble and crumble because of management that was not willing to get rid of people or move people away or move them into different jobs when it needed to happen. You have to do it. It's, it's, it's an uncomfortable, unfortunate thing, but... It's part of the territory, right? It's part of the territory. Um, you, you know, uh, we've interviewed quite a few uh, folks before you as part of our Enlightened Entrepreneurship mm -hmm. Series, and it, it seems like somewhere along the way, there's this idea that they were pursuing something that they were passionate about. Mm -hmm. Von Chouinard was an avid climber and outdoorsman, so he kind of pursued his passion mm -hmm. that way. And 
Doug Otto from Deckers was an avid surfer and wanted to find something to do outside, so mm -hmm. he started selling sandals. With, with local market launch, mm -hmm. is this something that you're passionate about, or are you passionate about the challenge of starting a new business from the ground up again? I'm passionate about the challenge, and I'm passionate about figuring out, figuring this thing out. You know, there, this is it's a big puzzle. You know, how how is the local merchant going to deal with the new realities of social media and the internet and the mobile technology? How is that going to happen? And how is that going to help his business? Because it's, if it doesn't help it, it's going to hurt it. So the ones participating are already benefiting. So how do I figure that out? That's a challenge. That's a puzzle. That's fun. To me, that's fun. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I took 10 years off for the most part, you know, and, and when I originally did Value Click, you know, my, one of my greatest motivators was money, but it wasn't the money, it was really the freedom. I wanted the freedom to be able to do what I want when I wanted. I wanted the freedom to be able to surf when the surf was good and dive when the diving's good and then still work, you know, but, but the freedom and, and the money has never really motivated me. It's, it's been more about a, a freedom thing. And now the money is more of a scorecard of, yeah, well, let's see if we can drive this to $100 million. Let's see if we can drive it to $500 million. You know, when ValueClick went public, my first eight employees were multimillionaires. You know, I want to see that happen again. That, that's my personal measure for success for a local market launch. Right. If everybody in that building, that little building we're in right now, is, is a multimillionaire in five years, we did good. You said you have job openings, is that what you're yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know you've touched on this, um, but I want to ask it again, Brian, mm -hmm. for the benefit of our students who are here this evening mm -hmm. and, and for uh, all audience members, of course, but what advice would you give to young people today, speci specifically um, students who are in college pursuing an education? Mm -hmm. What kind of advice would you give them about this process, this time in their life? the importance of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I didn't get to go to college, as I mentioned, uh, and I think it's a privilege, and, and I'm really happy my son's gonna go to college, and, and uh, you know, there's a ton of opportunity. It, it, I, I guess the best advice, really, is to get to know yourself and what makes you happy, and get to know what gets you excited. Don't get yourself down a hole where you're not looking forward to Monday morning. I look forward to Monday mornings. You know, I do, I, I look forward to it. it. It's, you know, I love the weekend. I, I spend a lot of time with the family and Monday morning I'm chopping at the bit and I go running in and oh, let's do this, let's do that. We have new ideas. It's fun and it should be fun. And if you could get to know yourself first and what you love to do and then craft your life around that and do that and look forward to Monday morning, that is success. And you can't put a dollar figure on that. It's great to have toys, and it's great to have a lot of money, and beach houses and everything else, but to be happy, that's not happiness. Happiness you know, comes from enjoying life every day, you know, not, just, not just being out there and doing it for the money. So the advice I would give is, is to get to know yourself and get out there and do, and be an active member of, of a team, you know, whether it's an entrepreneur team or, or it's you know, different people are happy in different, different things, and it's who you are. And, and if you're happy, guess what? You're gonna be good at it. The people who are good at something, they're the happy people. You know, the people who are not that good at it and they're struggling every day and they, you know, they, they feel like they're a fraud in many cases, well, they're not happy, you know? So try to get yourself in any way you can to know what makes you happy and to put yourself in that, in that place. I really appreciate that advice. Uh, uh, I've, I've kind of asked this general question of our guests over the past uh, few years. Uh, do you ever just step back for a moment, having created this amazing, successful company, Value Click, mm -hmm. and kind of look in the mirror some days and go, "Why me? How did? How, why did? Why did this happen to me? What, were, what was the magic formula here?" Or yeah. as Melissa and I were talking the other day. Well, what, what's that golden nugget? What is that? Yeah. Well, it is a magic formula. And the magic formula is, it, it's great people, and it's luck. There's luck involved, there's no question about it. You have to be in the right place at the right time. Now, people say, well, you make your own luck, you know, and yeah, you do. 
you know, because you're there and you're ready for it and you're prepared for the opportunity when the opportunity comes. But there is luck involved and, and, and nothing's a given and value click wasn't a given. We didn't even know if this internet thing was gonna be around in a few years, right? It was new, it was brand new and, and does it work? And it's, it's just, just all questions. And, uh, and you have to get lucky. I mean, something could happen, you know, tomorrow, uh, you know, to the nation or terrorism or something and all of a sudden nobody wants to invest and money dries up, whoops. Then what? Well, that plan B. What's plan B? You know, so so you have to have some luck, and and I am definitely blessed in so many ways, because I am sure that there are a lot of people out there, a lot smarter than I am, who work a lot harder for a lot longer, and they don't have anything, and and you know that's humbling. You know, when I drive down to L.A. and I see these people bent over in the fields picking strawberries, you know, I know there are people out there smarter than I am. I know they're working harder, and I know they want to succeed, and they, they were not given that opportunity. You know, I was given the opportunity, yes, I took advantage of it, and yes, I made a lot of it happen, but, you know, it, it doesn't, I don't feel cocky about it. I don't feel like Superman because of it. I feel humbled by it, you know, and thankful. Well, I really appreciate that response. I, I think that you are a living testimony that, uh, good things can happen to good people. And uh, on behalf of the Scheinfeld Center and the Small Business Development Center and all the folks here tonight, we just want to sincerely thank you for sharing your story and coming out and being with us tonight. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.